Hello, my name is Jason Webster. I'm lead commercial agronomist for Precision Planning, and I also manage the PTI farm, the Precision Technology Institute. Thanks for coming to Winter Conference. Congratulations, you've made it to the final session of Winter Conference 2024. Over the next few minutes, we're gonna talk about results. We're gonna talk about what the 2023 growing season taught us. We're gonna talk about results from the PTI farm, the Precision Technology Institute. This is Precision Planting's on-farm research center. It was founded back in 2018. It's in Pontiac, Illinois, and at this farm, we conduct hundreds of agronomy trials. We're challenging the status quo, trying to implement the practices that you folks are used to using on your farms, and we're comparing it to something else, something else that can hopefully increase yield or increase profitability. When the calendar flips to July, August, in September, we open our doors at the PTI farm and we welcome growers from all over the world. Matter of fact, let's go to the PTI, PTI farm. We'll do it via Google Earth. We're located in Pontiac, Illinois, right along Interstate 55, and we've got great visibility. And we are open and honest. We invite growers in and we have a conversation about being better. I mentioned we have hundreds of agronomy trials on this farm and when you come visit us, which hopefully you will this coming summer, but when you come visit us, we just go out into these agronomy trials. We talk about what the objective is of trying to be better. And then if we have data harvested from the six years we've been at the PTI farm, we talk about conclusions. And then it turns into an ag forum. What do you think? What are the challenges on your farm? Can we come up with some solutions for those challenges that we talk about every single day at the PTI farm? Really when it comes down to this, this is what the PTI farm is though. It's about putting ideas into action. Now I want you to take a look at the screen right now. You're gonna see a couple circles. You look at the circle on the left and think about your farm. Think about the things that matter to you on your farm, okay? There's lots of things probably going through your mind right now. But then look at the other circle on the right. Let's think, let's think about things that we can control. Think about it, in farming, how much can you control? Let's talk about that for a minute. You see some things on the screen right now. How many of these items matter to you? Well, let's go through a couple of them. Let's talk about um, grain prices. Oh my gosh, can you control grain prices on your farm? Well, I wish we could, that'd make things a lot easier, but it ends up something we can't control and we react from it. How about the weather? Oh my gosh, drought, floods, can you control that on your farm? No, that is definitely a reaction process, right? Rising input costs, I can't control that. You can't control that. Interest rates, we can't control that. Disease, all of these things, they definitely matter on your farm, but we cannot control them. So let's go back to the circles. At the PTI farm, we wanna live right in that little sliver between these two circles. The things that matter, but yet the things that we can control. And that's where we're gonna to go to work. We're gonna test those things. We're gonna challenge the status quo, and we're gonna see if we can increase yield or increase profitability. That's what we're gonna focus on. So let's get into some of the results. You know, as I was preparing this, this presentation, I thought, what, what is the best message that I can bring for Winter Conference 24? And while I was doing this, my phone rang. And during the day, I get a lot of phone calls from farmers asking agronomic questions. We have some, some great conversations. And I had one farmer, he called me and he says, Jason, knowing what you know now from the 2023 growing season, if you could go back in time, hit the rewind button and go back and do it again, what are some things that you would do different? And I smiled when the grower asked me that question because that has been a very common question from this fall as the combines were rolling and then all winter long. And I thought, you know what, that's the message I'm gonna bring to Winter Conference. What did we learn? And if we could go back in time, what would I have done different? So over the next few minutes, we're gonna talk about five things that I learned at the PTI farm. If I could go back in time, this is what I would do differently. Number one, let's talk about the planter. That's one of the things we do here at Precision Planting, right? I'm gonna go, if I could go back and do it all over again, I would go to my planter and I would remove every single stage closing system that I have on the planters at our farm. Now, the thing is, at the PTI farm, we test a lot of closing systems. 
um, on, on the PTI form. Our, our objective is to evaluate yield and economics of distinctly different types of single stage and two stage closing systems, and then we put them into different environments. We, we're not gonna test just one environment, we wanna look at variability. How do we do that? We're gonna look at different tillage environments with these closing systems. Now, the different tillage programs. I try to have what everybody is using um, we, we got conventional tillage, and then we look at the re reduced tillage programs, vertical till, strip till, and no-till. And we're going to ask ourselves a couple questions. Does my tillage program determine what closing system I need on my planter? Or, here's another question, is there one closing system that will work on them all? Now, the data I'm going to bring you here today. This is, these are the closing systems that we had in our testing protocol. Okay, and we'll go through these one by one, but you'll notice there's distinctly different closing wheel systems uh, on the screen right now. Now, this is the closing system that is probably most familiar to all of you. This is what we've used for decades and decades, the smooth rubber system. It's also been one that has posed us a lot of challenges, and that's why there's so many aftermarket closing systems available for sale for, for options for your planter at home. This is a single stage system. It's controlled by that T-handle attached to a spring. That's how you control the aggressiveness. But this is one that you're all familiar with and probably have removed some of these systems from your planter over the, over the past years. We get rid of the rubber system and I call this the plastic nub wheel. This is where we remove the rubber. We go to these lightweight plastic wheels. Again, this is a single stage system attached with that spring and that T-handle, but a manual system, okay? Now we keep the plastic inner wheel and we replace the rubber. This is a new system that we added to our protocol system this year. This is called the germinator, so it's a steel ring you put outside of the wheel. It's got a ledge on it. Again, a manual system. You're gonna control the aggressiveness with that single T-handle. Another new system for us that we added to our protocol is from Martin Till. This is called an F crusher system. Again, it's a heavier wheel. It's got those notches on it. Again, a manual system controlled by the T-handle. Now the systems start to look a little different. Now we're going to what we call two-stage systems. This is a manual two-stage system, again from Martin Till. And you've got two settings on this. You've got the traditional T-handle for the front stage or the first stage of this closing system. And then you've got the, the lobe on the backside to control the aggressiveness of that big fat rubber tire. We're comparing all these closing systems to Precision Planting's active two-stage system called Furrow Force. Now, when we think about closing systems, I want them to do two things for me. All I'm asking for my closing system is to do two things. Number one, does that planter makes a pass, those disc openers are gonna create those sidewalls and I need to lift and fracture them. I need to remove them, make it look like I was never there. And then the other thing a closing system needs to do for me is remove the air pocket. Now, if you look at the screen right now, you, you see a seed that we put in the furrow. We did not remove the side walls and that seed is surrounded by an air pocket. So this seed will not germinate quickly because it's attached to air, not soil where it can imbibe the moisture from the soil. Let's get into the results. Real quick though, I will, this is my little disclaimer for this study. This is all manual. I just showed you furrow force a little bit ago and described it as an active two-stage system. For this trial though, it's all manual. We've had a lot of growers say, well, Jason, all these other closing systems that you're testing, they're manual settings, you know, with your T-handle. And I said, yes. And they said, well, why don't you test furrow force that way to make it fair? And I said, you know what, let's do that. We're gonna compare apples to apples today. So all of these closing systems will be totally manual settings. All right, now I mentioned we're gonna look at different tillage programs. Here's my most aggressive right here. This is my, my primary tillage. This is a disc ripper in the fall, and then we're gonna work at one time with a soil finisher in the spring. And my question to you is, what type, of, what type of closing system do I need in this environment? Well, here's the results. You'll see furrow force on the right on the, in the green bar. We're running 280 bushel corn, some really high yielding corn. This is dry land, not irrigated. But you can see that the furrow force in a manual setting, this is 35 pounds, it simulates a standard setting on the 2020 monitor, did in fact beat all the other closing systems in this conventional tillage. Not a huge range here, but look at the very bottom of the graph, you'll see all of them have a net loss on an economic basis, every single one of them. That's conventional tillage. Let's go to a different tillage program. 
Let's go to strip till. We're very big advocates of strip till at the farm. It's not conventional tillage, it's not no-till. Also allows us to ban fertilizer. We really like this system. But if I go to this, what type of closing system do I need on my planter to be most effective? Here's the results. Running 277 bushel corn with furrow force. This is where we start to see some discrepancy. Now these other closing systems that we're testing, we're seeing some large numbers here. Look at the dual rubbers are seven bushel off the pace, the Martin two stage, 10 bushel off the pace, and now look at the corresponding yield lo or, uh, economic losses on a per acre basis. You'll see some of them approaching $50 losses. That's an important number because when you come to the PTI farm this summer, you're gonna hear me talk about what can you do on your farm to make another $50 an acre? And ladies and gentlemen, we have one right here just with the way we have our closing system on the planter. We're gonna talk about more as we go through the presentation here today. Let's switch gears, let's go to a different tillage program here. Let's get away from strip till and let's go to vertical tillage. This is one of the biggest trends in the industry, folks going to vertical tillage. I look at this tillage program and say, all right, now we're really gonna to have to look at our closing system. What is going to work best in this tillage environment? Let's go to the data from this fall. 275 bushel corn with furrow force in that manual setting and look at the yield differences with these other manual closing systems. Again, we're starting to see 12 bushel losses, 11 bushel losses, quite a bit of yield difference here. And again, look at that bottom line. Now we've got some closing wheels that are losing 60, almost $70 on a per acre basis. Lastly, no-till. We're trying to implement more no-till at the PTI farm, but this is, this is really important if we're gonna do this because you're gonna have to have a good closing system to get rid of those sidewalls and push that air pocket out in this no-till or reduced tillage environment. Look at this, you know, I told you we're testing that dual rubber system. You know, we've used it for decades and we've, we've kind of gotten rid of it on some of our planters because it couldn't perform very well. Here's a perfect case. That system just can't handle a no-till system. That's a 17 bushel loss per acre and we're approaching over $90 on a per acre loss. Tremendous, but all the other systems as well, net losses across the board. So I got all this data calculated, I presented it to you today. I, I thought maybe let's just average all the data. Okay, let's look at it in all of our tillage environments. You might be saying, well, why would you do that? I know on your farm, you probably have one tillage program, but if you look at your individual farms, you may not be flat, black, and beautiful. You have a lot of variability, a lot of roll, different soil types and things like that. And that's why we wanted to look at different tillage programs, average them all together to look at the variability. And you can see these closing systems that we tested, yield losses from five bushel all the way up to near 10 bushel per acre. You look at the economics of this. And again, those are significant losses of near $50 per acre on some of these systems. So getting back to what would I do different if I could do things over again, I would go to my planters that have the single stage system on them and I wanna get rid of them. I wanna take that, that, that manual single stage closing wheel system off the planter and I wanna replace it with a two stage active system in furrow force. That first stage of furrow force, lifting and fracturing our sidewalls, it's done an excellent job for us. And then the small rubber wheels on the back being our, our second stage, stitching that soil together and pushing that air pocket out. Now, even though we tested this as a manual closing system here today, but one of the biggest value propositions with this system is it can measure and it can react and it can change. That's why we say it's active and it'll do a tremendous job for us. Now look at the, the, the video on the screen here. We're gonna see furrow force on the left and we're gonna see these competitor single stage manual systems on the right. We set the planter down, we make the planter pass. Now look at the competitor systems on the right. Look where that seed is tucked into the trench. Can you see where the sidewalls were? Yes, you can, They're, they haven't been removed and we've also got an air pocket next to that seed. You guys ever done this? You guys that run the, the planter at home, if you ever done this where your closing system didn't work properly, you didn't remove the sidewalls, you left an air pocket, and then it didn't rain. You ever had that happen where it dries out and you can almost look down, if you're walking through the field, you can look down into the trench and actually see the seed. You guys ever had that happen? That's a bad day. It happens a lot though, but that just means your closing system didn't perform. Look at furrow force on the left. See how that seed is tucked in? You can't see where those sidewalls were at. We don't have an air pocket. This is important because this is gonna give us our fastest germination and uniform emergence. 
You see, we do flag testing at the PTI farm. We do this every single year. Every 12 hours, we're out flagging our corn, looking at uniform emergence, because we know if we don't get uniform emergence, we're gonna lose yield. How much? We give ourselves 12 hours. From the first time a seedling pokes its head up out of the ground, the first one in our field, within 12 hours, we want the rest of them up. 12 hours. Because after 12 hours, we start to see an 8% yield hit. Another 12 hours later, now we're out to 36 hours, we're losing a third of our corn crop potentially. We go another 12 hours to 48, we're losing 69% of yield. And then anything after 48 hours, that is tremendous with 80% crop losses. So it's very important to get fast, uniform emergence. All right, what else would I do different if I could do 2023 over again? I would have banded more fertilizer. It, we've had a quest at the PTI farm to get rid of broadcast fertilizer. You've heard about um, our band versus broadcast information here at Winter Conference. We're trying to get rid of the broadcast fertilizer. I don't want to fertilize every square inch of my soil. I want to put fertilizer near the mouth of the plant that, that, that we're growing, and I want to put it in a concentrated band, and this has worked out really well for us at the PTI farm. While we're banding fertilizer, we also look at rate efficiencies. I will put 100% rates on to compare band versus broadcast, but you know what? I get a lot of growers that'll come to me and say, Jason, you're banding fertilizer, so as a result, can you use less fertilizer? Is that a good question? That is a very good question. It's a question that I'd love to get an answer for. And so while we're doing our rate to our band versus broadcast at 100% rates, then we start backing them down by 25% all the way down to zero to look at the rate efficiency. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a 10 year program. It's fun. We're going to talk about multiple 10 year programs where we're looking at time. I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying to get as many replications as I can to really understand how this is working. And this is a 10 year program of doing these different rates every single year. Why do I say I'd like to do more banding if I could go back and do 23 over again? This is yield data on soybeans. A lot of times you hear folks talking about banding fertilizer on corn. It works for soybeans as well. Look at this, the orange bar on this graph, this is where we soil tested, we made a recommendation up, and we broadcasted 100% fertilizer like a lot of you do. Then we said, you know what, we're gonna put that same 100% rate of fertilizer on, but I'm gonna band it. I'll bring our, our strip till rig in and I'll band it. And that was an $11 winner, and you may say, well, Jason, that's not a very big win, but here's where it gets interesting. You remember the question, can I reduce fertilizer if I'm banding? I brought my rate down 25%. So now I have a 75% uh, rate off the recommendation, and look, now th that banding has given me a $47 win. Let's call it a $50 winner, another $50 winner that we talked about earlier. So you'll still see some positive values on the other reductions of fertilizer, and that is a result of still battling the high price of fertilizer. A lot of you folks have forgotten about this, but you know, the data I just showed you is from fertilizer I paid and I bought back in the fall of 22. A lot of you folks have forgotten about that because you've paid for a new round of fertilizer this fall in 23, and fortunately, they were lower. But this is something we're gonna watch, another benefit of having a 10-year program where we can look at volatility, volatility of prices. All right, what else would I do different? One of the things that I would do different if I could do 23 all over again is I would have planted more narrow row corn in the form of 15-inch rows. You see my 30-inch my rows on the right of the screen, and then I've got my 15-inch corn rows on the left. We knew right away, early spring, that, that narrow row 15 inch corn could potentially be a monster this year. Why? Because of this. Many of you folks probably battled some degree of drought this year. This is 30 inch rows and you can see that corn. This was taken in June and we had some serious drought stress back in June. I wanna show you some weather data. The, the drought actually started early in the season. It just was not in June. We received 34% of normal rainfall in April only 20% in May, and then in June, 6%. So we, once June rolled around, we had hot, dry temperatures, and the corn was struggling. Now this is 30 inch corn you see on the screen. Imagine putting a row right down the middle of those 30s for 15 inch row corn. What would that do potentially in a hot, dry environment? Well, think about plant to plant competition. In 30 inch rows, we gotta to get to the seeding rate we want, we gotta put those seeds close together. That's plant to plant competition. Look at the picture here on the screen, look at the sunlight. Do you see sunlight hitting the soil surface in these 30 inch rows? Yes, and what happens when that occurs? 
That sunlight's gonna hit the soil surface and you're gonna increase soil temperature. That's a bad thing in a drought, right? And then what about water preservation? That's, that sunlight hitting the soil surface is gonna burn more moisture. So all along, we're comparing our 30 inch rows this spring to 15 inch rows. And we thought, you know what? We might have something here. Look at the 15 inch rows. Look at the sunlight. It, 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 you're not getting as much sunlight hitting the soil surface. It's cooler and we're not burning as much water. And we thought once the combine rolls, I wonder if we're gonna see a yield difference. And ladies and gentlemen, I mean, the corn in 15 inch rows, it was a lot of fun to watch this. I mean, look at the corn on the screen here. I mean, some of this 15 inch row corn is so healthy. It was getting through those dry conditions and I couldn't even tell what row, what row direction we planted. Tremendous sunlight interception on this. As we rolled the combine, the results came in, tremendous results. This is actually two year results on our 15 inch row corn. And the only real way I know how to test 15 inch row corn is to compare it to 30 inch rows at 36,000 seeding rates because that's what I do at the PTI farm. And so we take that 36,000 normal rate in 30s and then we bring 15s in and we run seeding rate from 28,000 all the way to 52,000 seeds per acre. And you can see on the screen, we had a sweet spot, sweet spot of populations of 36, 40, and 40, 44,000 seeds per acre that were giving us yield or dollar advantages over 30 inch rows at 60, 70, and almost $85 an acre. It's just absolutely monstrous uh, yields and economics compared to our status quo 30 inch rows. You may be saying, well, wait a minute, narrow row corn, what about 20 inch rows? Yeah, we're using 20 inch rows. Matter of fact, we've been testing it from 19 to 23. That's 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, that's five years. We're running about a $40 increase per acre on 20s versus 30s, but that's half of what we're seeing with some of our 15 inch rows. So even though we, we have less years of data on 15, we've got two years of data, this is something that we're gonna look at. But if I could go, could, could go back and do anything different this past year, I would have planted more 15 inch row corn. One of the things that I think I would do differently as well is if you're gonna grow narrow row corn, one of the things we've learned is nitrogen on the planter is crucial. And probably some of you are thinking, well, if I go narrow row corn, how in the world am I gonna side dress some of my corn? That might be a little difficult, right? With the narrow rows and equipment. And so if you're one of those growers that don't know if you can quite side dress effectively, we're adding nitrogen to the planter and we're really seeing some, some nice differences. Here's an example of us putting nitrogen on the planter in a narrow row environment. We're picking up 9.3 bushel increase yield. And look at that ROI, that's a $49 winner. Let's call it a $50 win once again. So this, this has been a really nice, nice way of adding to our narrow row corn with our nitrogen management. How are we doing the nitrogen management? We're going right to the planter, we're going to the gauge wheels, we're using Conceal to apply our nitrogen. The data today, we're using a dual band Conceal system where we've got knives inside the gauge wheels on both sides of where we planted the corn and we're applying nitrogen. And some of you may, may be saying, well, gosh, Jason, you know, nitrogen, that's a salty product. Is, is, it, is it too close? And no, it's about three inches away from where we planted the seed. It's far enough away to, for crop safety, but it's close enough so that corn plant can get that nitrogen in early stages and don't slow that corn plant down. It's been a really effective way for nitrogen management, especially in narrow row corn. All right, what else would I do different if I could go back and do 2023 over again? I would have changed my cover crop program. Okay, I know a lot of you folks are probably growing cover crops. I'll tell you though, cover crops were a real challenge in 2023 because of the weather. I'll bring the weather data back up. We were down 10.5 inches of rain this spring. And how do you think that affected my cover crop program? I had an active cover crop growing in the field. I planted it the fall before. It's up and growing. What do you suppose it's trying to use to grow? Water? nutrients, and I didn't have any water. We were in a drought. I was already down 10 and a half inches of rain. And look, I'm stripped till I mentioned that earlier. I'm gonna plant a new tender sensitive crop right into the strip up here, and I can't let it compete. I can't let it compete. And that cover crop, it's got a larger root system. And a lot of times it did compete with me and it caused challenges. What did it look like? Look at the screen. This is some of my corn. This is replicated strips of cover crop 
okay? This was corn, this is corn after soybeans. We put a cover crop out, and you can see right to the row where my cover crop is. Matter of fact, you see some of my irrigation that I laid. We laid irrigation in May. It's the earliest we've ever started to irrigate corn because of the drought situation and where the cover crop was actually using more water. We never did save this corn. We tried, we worked hard to do it. Consequently, we lost about 43 bushel of corn. You take that times the price of corn and add in the cost of the cover crop program. Congratulations, I lost $277 on a per acre basis. Want to do it again next year. This one hurt, it really did. And I had growers calling me from all over the country saying, Jason, I've got this same thing going on. Do I rip it up and start over again? And my comment was this, do you have enough moisture to replant and get the corn up out of the ground? And most farmers said no. And so this was a real challenge. You know, you look at my track record, I mean, this is a 10-year program. We talked about that earlier. This is another 10-year program at the farm. So I want to look at time here. You know, this year was a bad year for it because of the weather, but, you know, the first two years, you know, this will be my fourth year coming up in 2024. You know, the previous two years, I did okay. I never lost yield one year, and one year I actually picked up four and a half bushel of corn. But I will say this, though, you add the cost of the, the program in to buy the seed and, and to put it in the ground, I've never made money on my cover crop program. And some people may be disappointed in this. I'm excited about this because I'm, I'm waiting to see the transition. Some folks say it's gonna take time to put a cover crop program in and see the benefits. I'm hoping to see that very, very quickly here. It even happened with soybeans. We started harvesting soybeans where we had a cover crop program in place. And I thought, you know what? This is my answer. This is, what, this is where cover crops are going to be a good fit because we were harvesting 91.3 bushel beans, dry land beans in our cover crop. I said, this is where it's going to be. The problem is I got into my control areas where I didn't have a cover crop and the beans were going over 100 bushel. Consequently, I lost almost 11 bushel of yield. Take that times the price of soybeans and the cost of the program, and this was a $183 loser. So both crops really suffered with cover crops. What would I do different if I could go back and do it again? Well, one option would have been not to plant a cover crop. <laughs> and I know some of you are, say, are, are kind of thinking, wait a minute, this is an agronomist at precision, precision planting. You cannot make fun of cover crops. And I see the value in cover crops. I want them to work for me, I do. The benefits of soil health and nutrient sequestration, those are all good things. And so I still would have planted a cover crop, I would have. But I probably would have changed the species to something that would have winter killed so it wasn't that competitor for me in the spring in the drought conditions. I would have terminated earlier too, knowing that there was a drought coming. I would have terminated a lot quicker. Although I don't think the cooler temperatures would have allowed me to, to have done it, but I would have tried. And then the other thing I would have done differently, my at plant nutrition in the cover crop. So we have a fertilizer reallocation program where in the fall, when we're putting our fertilizer on in our strips, we back the rate of dry fertilizer down because we know we're gonna come back into the spring with our planter and put more fertilizer on. So we reallocate so I'm not over applying and overspending. But this is really important in a cover crop program because of the competition. That larger root system on that cover crop, it can steal nutrients away from that tender sensitive crop that I'm putting in the strip. And so what we do is we go to, we go to furrow jet on the planter and conceal. We've already talked about conceal, but furrow jet is, an, is a way for us to get in furrow next to the seed to apply nu nutrition. And at the PTI farm, we call this the five-point touch. You see the, the orange bands, that's where furrow jet comes in and applies nutrition next to the seed. And then we've got conceal in those bands three inches away. But this really protects that young seedling in the strip and protects it from the, the competitiveness of that cover crop. Where we installed this program, implemented this program in our cover crop programs at the farm, we picked up 15.3 bushel of yield and look at the dollar amount. This is another $50 winner, almost near $60. All right, the last thing that I would do different, it's about harvest. I would have harvested higher moisture corn at the farm. You're probably saying, Jason, why would you have done that? Well, some of you know that we've been working on a new drying and storage facility at the PTI farm. This was our first fall of running grain through this system, and we learned a lot. I had some questions going into this. One question was phantom yield loss. You guys ever heard that, invisible yield loss? If you let your corn dry down naturally in the field, do you lose yield? That was a question I had with this. The other question in the back of my mind was, what, what harvest moisture makes me the most money? I really wanted to look at that going in to the fall. Did phantom yield loss happen? Yes, it did. 
Now, we started harvesting corn at 27%. I wanted it to be 30, but I never made it in time. The corn dried down a little faster than what I wanted it to. But we got in at 27%, and I'll just tell you, it was my highest yield. We're running 254 uh, bushel corn. It was my highest yield. We let it dry down to 24%. I lost 2.3 bushel on a per acre basis. I let it dry down to 20%. Now I'm losing almost seven bushel, and my largest yield losses came with allowing that corn to dry down to 18%. I wanted it to 15, but I couldn't get it there. But I lost about 11 and a half bushel, allowing it to dry down to 18% corn. Now, if I'm taking corn to my local grain terminal, I have to pay for the drying charges, right? And so now getting back to this most economical uh, harvest moisture, if I'm taking it to town, paying the commercial drying rates, 24% corn was my most economical moisture to harvest at. Now, I have a dryer at the farm now and I'm drying my own corn. How does that factor into it? I can dry the corn a lot, a lot, you know, it doesn't, it's not as expensive. And so now all of a sudden, my most economical harvest moisture is my highest one at 27%. I also want to look, I wanted to look at shrink. One of the things I don't quite understand yet is when I take corn to my local grain terminal, they charge me shrink. You guys know what I'm talking about with shrink. You know, you, you take wet corn to the elevator, you have to take the water out of it to figure out how many actual dry bushels you have. But Purdue University Extension did a study where they said 15% corn, you dry the corn down to 15%, the actual shrink is 1.176 at 15% corn. The problem is when I deliver grain to my terminal, grain terminal, they charge me 1.4%. And I want to know why. Why is there a grain handling charge that no one is telling me about? And I'd kind of like to know what it is, and I'd like to know how much I'm paying on a per acre basis. The other thing I want to evaluate is seasonal price difference. Can I take advantage of rallies with that system? Because remember, I'm not giving up possession of my, my grain. I can keep it and sell it on, on rallies. I can take, care, take advantage of premiums as well. That's one of the things we want to look at, look at with the system. My grain dryer, let's get back to that. You know, I'm drying my own corn. We want to get to natural gas. We've got access to it, but this first year we were using propane. But we really, it was really interesting looking at the cost of drying corn on the farm versus commercial. Now remember the four moistures that we talked about for phantom yield loss? What does it cost me when I deliver that wet corn to my local grain elevator? You can see the cost up on the screen. To deliver 27% corn, I have to pay to get that dried and it's gonna cost me 31 and a half cents on a per, per bushel basis. When I dried my own corn on the farm, I got it down to a, a, a penny and a half per point. What does that mean? Well, I saved about $30 an acre in just drying alone. Remember the cost of the shrink we talked about? It wasn't as much as I thought it was, you know, up, going up to 1.4%. It was about $3 an acre though, and that's one of the things that we're really going to look at going forward. The phantom yield loss, we lost about $6 an acre. It, it could have been worse, but I didn't harvest a lot of my corn at the super low moistures. Okay, so the, we didn't have as much phantom loss. I think next year as we look at harvesting at some of the higher moistures, we'll see where that number changes. But all in and all out, I think the system saved me about $87 an acre. And when we look at return on investment, came in right at 13% ROI. Now, I want to tell you a little story. I'm putting all these numbers together and I like to have other people look at my math, you know, and proofread a little bit to make sure I don't make mistakes. And I sent this in to some grain folks and I said, take a look at, at my drying numbers here and make sure everything's right. And all of a sudden, everybody got concerned. Everybody said, Jason, something's wrong here. And I'm like, what do you mean something's wrong? And they said, there's no way in the world you can, you can have that low of a drying expense with your local grain term terminal. I said, what, what are you talking about? I said, here's my prices that I'm paying to my local grain elevator. And I said, no way, they're, they're, they are just way too cheap. So, I started looking around a little bit. I said, what, why is everybody saying this is wrong? This line graph you see on the screen, the three lines on the bottom are the three closest grain terminals closest to the PTI farm. And you can see the corresponding cost of drying for each of those three elevators at the four moistures we talked about here today. Then I went outside of Illinois because it, it's quite apparent the drying costs are different across the country. And so we went north and west where it's typically more expensive to dry corn. We pulled some South Dakota harvest rates and you can see on the line graph, that yellow line, it's considerably higher to dry corn in the Northwest. 
How much more? You can see on the screen the difference is it's like three times more at that high moisture of 27%. So I reran the numbers then using the South Dakota higher costs and everything changed. I made $30 an acre drying my corn at the PTI farm. If I use South Dakota fees, all of a sudden my drying goes to $100 savings on a per acre basis. And now my 13% ROI goes up to 23%. Both situations, though, having the technology, whether it's a 13% ROI or a 23% ROI, I think those numbers are pretty good, though. I mean, think about your 401k account, your retirement account. Think about your stock portfolio. You're making 13 to 23%. Is that good? That's pretty good, I think. So for our first year on the farm, I think it was really interesting. But I would have gone back. If I could go back in time, I would have harvested more higher moisture corn. Wow. In a short period of time, we covered five topics. That's it, five topics from the PTI farm. How do you get more data? If you're interested in seeing more results, there's some ways uh, to, to, to get data. One is we'd love for you to be an insider. Uh, you can go to InsidePTI.com, and this is where we produce agronomic videos at the PTI farm, and we'll send them to your email inbox where you can watch these agronomic videos at your leisure. But this is just out in the field showing you the objective, showing whatever data or conclusion we have for all of our trials, but it's a free online video sent to your email. You can go to InsidePTI and sign up for this, again, for free, free of charge. One way to stay connected is we'd love for you to come see us this summer at the PTI farm. How do you get an invite to come to the PTI farm? Simple. Talk to your local precision planning premier dealer and they would love to give you a VIP experience. We just released our 2023 yield summary report. This is also available free of charge through your Precision Planning Premier dealer. You can ask for this, get this as a paper copy or an electronic copy, but this year, 265 pages, over 100 trials in this yield summary report. Again, free of charge. And lastly, starting next week, we're gonna go on tour. We're, gonna, we're going on tour to what we call Inside PTI Live. We're gonna have 17 stops across the country, 16 locations. I think we're traveling through 13 states and we're gonna dive into more PTI agronomy. Here's a list of all the locations. I won't go through them all. You can see them up on the screen, but hopefully there'll be a meeting near you where we can come together and talk about agronomy. And I, I think our best way to think about this meeting is we're gonna talk about more return on investment, more ROI. What are the things that made me the most money at the farm this year, at the PTI farm, and what are the things that cost me the most money? It may be hard to see the, the, the top 10 and bottom 10 up on the screen right now, but I'm doing it on purpose. I'm doing it as a little teaser. So you'll come to one of our Inside PTI meetings and, and, and talk about this with us, have a conversation about being better. But you can go to our website and register, and we'd love to see you at one of our Inside PTI Live meetings starting next week. Well, that's all the time we have for this session. Thank you so much for coming to Winter Conference. Thanks for allowing me to talk a little agronomy from the PTI farm. Hopefully you've learned something and you can take it home to your farming operation. Thank you very much.